All right then, let's get started. Hey, I just wanted to give you a little preview of the apps that I've collected for doing iPad music creation. Here they are. This is page one, and this is page two. Now there are several types of apps, ones that are just pure sound sources, other ones that are controllers, like keyboard simulators or touchscreen emulators uh, or guitar string playing emulators and others are just effects like compressors or chorus or phaser or EQ limiting things that modify an audio signal. So let's look at a couple ones uh, I want to show you right off the bat. Just one that's called Mellow Sound. You just touch one key here and it plays a harp. And this is the recreation of a classic instrument called a Mellotron, which used uh, tape loops of samples in the 60s. Um, the Beatles used this a lot. There's cello. So it's just a really beautiful, organic sounding instrument. Um, and I like to use it. I reach for that when I want to get something uh, that sounds very non-digital. Um, obviously, it's a digital recreation of a very analog uh, tape-based instrument. So that's one that's a lot of fun. And you see, I often just use the, the built-in keyboard um, with, with my apps, uh, just touching it right there on the iPad. Now, another one, another classic. Let's just go to number two here. This is the Model D. This is the famous Mini Moog. Yes, it's not Moog, it's Moog. His name was Robert Moog, the inventor. Ooh, that's loud. But you can control the volume of that um, and all of the fat sounds that come with it. So you get the real, all of those controls. It's not a picture. You can actually move all of these. Let me use the pencil. You can actually move all of those dials, you see, um, and switches and control it. Um, what I often like to do is just start out exploring the presets for a new synthesizer so you know when you buy a couple synths maybe you check out some of the free ones always check out the the, the collection of presets these are um, memory patches that are uh, remember exactly where all those settings and buttons and switches and dials are uh, for each particular sound a synthesizer makes um, remember it wasn't always that way it wasn't until i think like uh, the profit five came out that that synthesizers could actually remember those settings you know the, the digital uh, technology had evolved very early there in the early 80s um, to make that possible or late 70s that's probably when it was anyhow you want that fat classic moog sound uh definitely i recommend getting uh several of the effects or presets patches Obviously, it's a mini Moog, but it's also an iPad, so it's obviously doing things that the, the actual instrument can't do, which is remember the patches and do some polyphony and other kinds of interesting things. That's multiple notes playing at once. Um, let's just close those down for a minute, and just you can see Synth 1. Now, this one's a free app. Definitely grab this free. It's from Digital Audio Kit. These guys are doing amazing open source work around samples from... Um, classic classic synthesizers like the Yamaha CS80 which was used in so many soundtracks um, can anyone say Blade Runner this is that synth oh my god it's amazing let's see what I've got here CS80 dark brass you know creepy and you see I just often use the built-in keyboard and you know you can always be fine just touching the white keys and playing in C major you know you don't have to touch the black keys or you can play with just the black keys and then you have like the opening of subdivisions by rush um, look so we're gonna talk about how some of these apps allow you to become a keyboard player with not knowing any music theory not knowing what notes are in an A flat you know major triad for example um, you don't have to know that it that's where the power of this computer comes in the iPad working with you
FM player, digital uh, D1. These are also from Audio Kit. Now this is going to uh, emulate the classic Yamaha F uh, uh, DX7. Hundreds of presets in there. Amazing sounds to explore. Um, I'll put a screenshot here in the and a list of these in the course description um, as a downloadable resource so that you can check out some of these. Now, you know, I've got maybe a couple hundred dollars worth of app purchases, but trust me, if I was going to buy an Oberheim or a Profit, either in the 80s or now, we're talking thousands of dollars. Um, so forget about it, right? I could never afford a Profit. I had a sequential circuits. I had a not a profit though. I always wanted one. Some of my favorite tracks were scored with these classic synths, and now I've got them for pennies on the dollar. Let's go into what's a really, really th popular thing to do, which is, an app, which is to use an app called AUM. Now, AUM means Audio Unit Mixer. So audio units are kind of um, AUV3 as they're known. These are the advanced and really economical in terms of processing power of your iPad uh, level of effects and instruments. Um, a lot of the newer stuff is done in AUV because it's more lightweight <clears throat> and you can use an app like Audio Unit Mixer to do things like you would normally do with a real mixer, either an analog or a digital mixer, and that is combine sound sources, apply effects, change levels, change routings, where those sounds go and how they're controlled. Um, but Because here it's all on the iPad, it's all being done digitally. Here's um, a three-channel setup. And it, what's really cool about this interface is that it's really, really well done. The graphic interface here, user interface here only shows you what you need to know about the instruments that are connected. You can see I've got a, that one of those D1s. There's the Yamaha D1. If I tap on the icon for it, I can see the presets here. I can go to my favorites, which is one of the things that I recommend you do as you go um, to any of these apps whenever you get a new synth. Go and listen to every and play something on every preset and just make your favorites so you can always go back to them and find them really easily. Um, so I always like to prefer the synthesizer apps that let me star them and then make a playlist of my own favorites so that I can find them. That's a power tip for you. And now I can sit there and control that, or I could noodle around with the knobs and dials and alter that sound. Um, I could adjust the layering with it. I could also apply a sequencer to it. In other words, I have full control as if I was running that app separately without having to swipe over between apps. So AUM, and I'll just X out of there, AUM lets you add and then control all of your sound sources, all of your synthesizers, if you will. Here I've got an SEM, which is a synthesizer expansion module. It's a recreation of an Oberheim, classic Oberheim um, device. It has a very uh, iconic sound palette. Um, so that's in channel two, the SEM. And over here is like a modern synth. This is something called phosphorus. And so this is very German. This is very, um, very strange but beautiful. And so all of these right now, and, and so in the middle there, you can see these are the fader levels. So I could make that louder or quieter and the same with each of them. I can also mute or solo any channel, just like it's a real mixing board. So as I'm setting up my sound, getting my sound balances, um, then I can also put uh, insert effects. Like I've inserted here a limiter on each of the sound sources. One of the things I've learned about doing iPad music is some of these, like that mini mode, for example, was so loud. Sometimes it, it causes distortion. And so putting a little limiter and knocking it down a couple dB on the input as a pre, it's a pro, pro audio tip for you there, gets it so that you don't have any of that distortion. So as you start to work with this, you're going to be up against the limits of the processor. And one of the cool things about AUM is it always shows you up here how much of your processor is being used. Right now we're using 
29, 32% of our processor. Um, and if you have uh, crackling noises, uh, you're going to need to adjust the buffer size. Now, it's going to depend on your iPad. But if you notice as you start to add instruments, you get, you're getting crackling noises, that's what you need to do is adjust that buffer size. And where you do that, of course, is under Settings. So if we go to Settings here in AUM, you can see the buffer size. I've set it 1024. Now, the iPad I'm using is iPad Pro, first generation iPad Pro. So everything I'm doing here is from an iPad Pro that was made in 2016. Uh, one of the things I want to dive into now is, okay, how do you use some of these things with like uh, an external controller? Like you can see here, I've got a, a keyboard, a wireless keyboard in fact, the LPK25 from Akai. It's, it's not expensive, it's less than 50 bucks probably. I don't even remember. It's not the greatest, but if you want to have a control and you can go up and down the octave here and you want a wireless uh, you can do that so that's a very common thing to do is to work with external gear now a lot of times you can come into the power uh, port here with uh, the Apple connection kit which has a USB and then any USB to MIDI interface that you've got so your MIDI controllers can control those apps on your iPad and give you those sounds and one thing I want to show you real quick is let's do that. Let's connect it. Let, I mean, there's a keyboard built in, right? If I tap on the icon down there. You can see that I've attached this keyboard to drive all three synthesizers at once. Keyboard. There it is. It's checked. Keyboard. Checked. Keyboard. Checked. So this is built-in keyboard. So we know it works with the built-in keyboard. Let's make it work with our external keyboard. Go back to settings, swipe down to Bluetooth MIDI. You can see this Bluetooth pairing here. It doesn't pair like a phone or headphones with your iPad. It has to be done through the app. So here we're gonna go to Bluetooth MIDI. I've enabled the pairing here and there it shows up. So the Akai LPK25 is connected. Now, it's connected, but it's not talking to those synthesizers. So let's do that, like I showed you, on the input selection up at the top for each device, each input. Now I can say, I would also like the Akai LPK25 wireless keyboard to trigger, trigger that synthesizer. And I would like it to also trigger this synthesizer, the ISEM, and also the D1. And then I can sit there and play that and say, what does it sound like with a bit more or a bit less of each of those? And right now the output is set to HDMI because I'm screen recording this. So that's going over to the Mac. It's QuickTime. I'm recording that separately. But you can also change the output to go to the speakers. That's usually what you're doing when you're setting up. So it's really intelligent here. So this is the output, where it's going. This is the input, what the device is. These are modifiers. In this case, I've got a limiter, right? And then over here is a control for that limiter. So I just knock it down almost 2 dB each time. I, I, that's a standard thing. I'll just put a limiter on the, on the front of every synthesizer. It's just kind of my style. And then over here, I've got another effect. This is something called dub station. And this is kind of a repeating delay that has some really nice musical qualities to it. And so if I wanted to add another device here, another effect insert, I can go to audio unit extensions, for example. And now for my ISEM, you can see from audio damage, there's the dub station. I've also got a phase three, which is um, a triple phase effect, a uh, four channel modulation, um, a lot of different things, EQ, so I could put on a, a specific EQ, 
you can see that's like a professional studio EQ where you can dial in exactly the frequencies you want to boost or cut. Mainly you cut um, in an EQ so that you get uh, a space for that instrument to live in the sound field. Yeah, and so that's how that's done. Um, you can add multiple effects, obviously. And uh, let's audition that. Let's cut the mids here. And if you don't like that, are you ready to be done with that? You can just swipe over to the left, and then guess what? You can eject. You can just jettison that effect. Pretty simple. It's also the same up here. You can jettison any of your inputs. Um, so I've shown you really quickly. Oh, and these controls over to the side here. These are one parameter that you can adjust and decide which parameter you would like to be able to have. So let's say you're playing. And you want to adjust the voltage control frequency or whatever. So if you tap on that instrument and select it, and then you go to the MIDI control, and then for each of those, okay, so here's the digital, um, the, the D1, the ISEM, and the phosphor. Let's take the ISEM, let's swipe down to the swipe down to where we see parameters. And over here is the list of any of I could put any of these controls over here as a quick access. So for performance, you know, sometimes when you're playing a synth, you want to be able to, you know, modulate it or adjust the, the filter envelope or do any of these controls. All you have to do is just like tap on it and then tap here. You see that icon is the same. Green is activated. And now VCF, voltage control frequency, mod amount is the parameter that we have up there to control. Now this is a lot to take in. But I wanted to show you some of the power and why it's worth studying an instrument like AUM to combine synths, bring in external controllers, bring in special effects. And because once you start noodling with this stuff, all you have to do is go up here and save it. And when you launch AUM the next time, all of those settings come back. So you can just save that as the wall of Sith, for example. That's what I call this. I don't know where these names come from. They just get inspired by the sounds that you're making. Um, I should mention, of course, it's got recording capability. So here's the recorder up here. Record, play, back. You can also set tempo, tap. You can set a meter. So if you did not want to record in 4-4 four, four time C major, you can do a waltz here in 3 quarter time. Um, so that's important when you bring in other instruments which may have a rhythmic element like drum machines, right? Beat makers. So when you want to add another instrument, obviously the big plus button over here is what you're going to choose. If you're going to choose an audio instrument, you're going to get a blank channel here. Uh, what instrument you want. Now I've been showing you everything here that's an audio unit extension. That is the modern um, app design that is the best standard to look for whenever you're looking for new apps. Make sure they have AUV3 audio unit extension um, capability. The, um, the earlier and older way to connect apps within the iPad uh, you know, ecosphere ecosystem was with something called IAA or inter app audio. So you'll see there's a bunch of apps that can connect through IAA and a lot of them that can only connect through IAA. So encourage your developer to adopt the, the, the more powerful uh, and uh, AUV3 version for connectivity. You can see that's a smaller list here of devices of, of, of apps that will support that. So one of those Let's see what I've got here. So these are audio unit extensions. So there's a bass player, a bass thing that I could program. I could bring in our Mellotron 
from before. I can real quickly make sure um, that I go to dynamics and just drop a peak limiter on there, lower it by a couple dB, make sure it doesn't override. Let's say I also want it driven by this keyboard. And let's solo it. It's not playing the harp sound. So let's go load that in. I'm tapping on there. There we have it. And was that loud enough? May not be the right instrument choice. That's what's fun is now you can really audition and change sounds within one screen without switching between apps, which is always really a mind bender and, and really hard to do. have something and let's say you want to bring in one of my favorite apps um, uh, a different type of controller something called touch scraper well it's only right now offering an inter app experience and really what I want from touch touch scraper is the the, the keyboard controller um, it makes sounds as well and when I add it Basically now it can also become a source here. You see Touchscaper as a keyboard source. Okay, It's not giving me um, much more than that. Uh, let's say I want it to Touchscaper to control this. I'm going to make it an AUM destination audio unit mix and then in Touchscaper these are the default sounds that are in here. You can change those instruments over here. And you can control it here with uh, AUM. So a main instrument, the ribbon instrument, which is down here, can also be AUM, and the B. So this lets you play the E minor chord, the F sharp minor chord. You can change those chord progressions. It's a really cool way to compose, you know, a musical fragment with, with chord progressions. And it does a lot more. Uh, I'll show you that a little bit more later, but I just wanted to give you a little sneak peek here. I want, but see how I'm in this app, and then I have to tap this icon of the AUM to switch back. That's the inter-app audio thing. Maybe you've experienced that with GarageBand when you've tried to use um, external synthesizers in GarageBand. Well, um, the AUM is a lot cleaner because if you can see, I only have AUM open and Touch Scraper. I mean, I've got settings open. Okay, and AUM has all of those effects and all of those synths open. So it's really a really a streamlined way to, to work, plus the digital signal processing overload um, happens with internet app audio. A lot of apps crash. But anyways, I do like to use this Touchscaper, AUM destination, and then I say maybe Touchscaper B, so that'll be instrument B, and then this one will be AUM and the ribbon controller. So those are different options um, from this Touchscaper controller. Also, you can decide with that instrument which range of notes will go to that instrument. So for the harp, I'll say I only want things from the upper end of the keyboard, say from C5 to G9, to to be, when those notes come from Touchscaper, that those notes will be played. So you can see how I did that. If you go to the side of the instrument, swipe till you see the bottom here. The note range that you decide can 
um, just correspond to either a, a certain keyboard range of nodes, right, or a controller like Touchscaper. I hope you can start to see this is a lot of fun, um, and that if you, um, you know, you get lost, you can always go back and revert. You can always start a new project. Open up AUM at the beginning. It just opens up really quick and really clean. It says, would you like to reload your last session? That's what it says in the lower. Or would you like to start a new project? And it doesn't overwhelm me. It just a little plus button. Let's start a new project. What would you like it to be? Audio, MIDI? Would you like to import audio or sound files? So you start maybe with an instrument. Okay? It gives you a simple channel. Let's say, let's go to an audio unit extension. Let's scroll down to something like... Oh, this is cool because this um, instrument I want to show you called the OBXD, it doesn't have a keyboard. So it's one of those instruments and it has all the great sounds of, of, a key, of an Oberheim, right? And no way to control it. So the first thing I'll do is I'll just say, please let me attach a keyboard. Oh, let me just show you. So if you open up, it's just the instrument. You know, there's nothing... There's nothing there. You see, that's the other thing about AUM. You can resize the application window. Okay, remind me because I want to show you a triple keyboard controller. And you can resize this. And you can have multiple synths, multiple keys going with different controllers. And really explore music creation. That's what I find is really good. And when you get something really good, just go over there and record it. And then you've got a visual note of what sounds, what key you were in. And a really good way to build songs from that exploration not just an audio recording but you get the visual as well um, that's what I like to do with the the work that I do but you can see the OBXD does not have a keyboard so if I had a keyboard now it's controlling it yeah but this one doesn't the wireless keyboard so I would need to attach that here we go it remembers the LK LPK 25 so now I can audition different presets. If I tap under here, that's about, you can control all of it manually. It's, it's really kind of like having an Oberheim, except that they've got beautiful patches over here. So if you want the Blade Runner bass pad, brass pad. Beautiful, beautiful, rich sounds. Again, any of these controllers, like um, you know, any of the filter envelopes, any of those controls, can be the parameter that we have up here for fast access. Again, if you had an outboard MIDI controller, you can also assign those parameters by MIDI. Yeah, so you can have all your twisty knobs out here in the real world controlling the virtual synth there on the iPad. This is just a really easy way, I think, to understand how electronic music is made on the iPad and the kind of quality that you can get quite easily. I'm going to open up a save project. I just want to make sure you understand this keyboard that's built in has three controls over here. One is the arrow going both ways, and that simply allows you to scroll to a different register. Okay, so you can play and audition sounds at, at different parts of the keyboard without having all 88 keys in there. Um, this infinite symbol will hold. Hold notes down as long as it's green. And then the wrench just lets you, again, have um, some MIDI controls here, what channel you want, which um, instruments are being controlled by it, uh, velocity range, etc. You can also see that up here, though, the MIDI mapping. And you can see that's a very simple MIDI mapping here uh, with this button. You can see which controllers and which sounds um, at a glance. Um, under the DSP, of course, you've got all that extra information about hardware connections. Under the uh, metering, you can decide what 
do you want to meet her? Do you want to meet her speakers? Do you want to meet her a bus? And so on, okay, or a channel input. So at, instead of having a whole bank of meters like on a traditional mixer, you've got one, then you can just choose which what do you want to look at at any given time uh, based on what you need. Very, very intelligent design here. Um, you can add notes to any project for or any session that you're working on. Um, I think uh, I've shown everything except for files. And so files are presets. So these are configurations I've made. I've shown you the wall of Sith. I've got something here called Creepsville. Creepsville? What's that, Rob? Well, it's going to load. You can see it's loading the D1. Now, the D1's pretty heavy heavy coated uh, synthesizer there. It's loading three synthesizers and it's loading a keyboard controller called the key K KB1 and it's uh, three instances of that. So three separate So now this keyboard is controlling the phosphor synth here. This keyboard controller is controlling the ISEM, and this one is controlling, oh, I just changed key there, the D1. Let me, so that's a, a remembering, it's a, it's a preset. It's got all the things that I, in that session that I explored, all of the effects that I had put in, and all of these keyboards are uh, configurable to a specific key. For example, this is in the key of G minor. It should probably be, yeah, G minor. That's the relative uh, minor to E major. So I can play chords over here in E major. And if I wanted to hear that, I could bring up the volume level of the ISEM. So I can go six, four, five, and resolve at one, and then I could solo over it in the key of A minor and have some nice, nice little, or G minor, sorry. So those are some of the things that you could do here. Uh, of course, you could just keep everything there in G major. Oh, there's all the different scales. Major pentatonic, Arabic, uh, Phrygian, Lydian, you name it, for E. Locrian, Mixolydian, let's just try Mixolydian. And whatever you set these to, again, when you save it, it'll remember even all of those micro settings that you make on your keyboard controller. So this is something called KB1, and you can decide what the keyboard looks like, whether it looks like strings, whether it looks like notes, um, how many rows you want. Uh, it's really cool. Let me just show you. Uh, for each of these, you know, we had our three synthesizers, and now we've got three keyboard controllers. So this one is going to control the D1. Let me just enlarge it here by grabbing the little icon down there. And you can see with the keyboard layout, um, you would have, you could use a classic one, you could use a scale. Okay, so you control that here with your keyboard layout. How many rows? Do you want two rows? Do you want two octaves? There's going to be a lot more buttons here, yeah? So you can see I've just created now kind of two octaves, two rows. And I can change the key. Let's go to E flat, Locrian. Okay, and it'll remember it. Now, I've done this with another one. Let's see, maybe the triple keys KB1 bop. Now this is gonna uh, switch to a completely different setup. 
But I think, I, again, I've got those same three synths, the D1, the ISEM, and the phosphor. Um, but now I've got uh, a setting that sounds like this from the D1. It's much more like I'm going to create some music for movies here. And now... A bell tree I've made here three rows for that preset sound on uh, one of my synthesizers and here's what's cool it's like if you want to know which one that's it says it gave it a name kb1 m4 you could give it context names you could say no you know actually that's the d1 so when I look up there I know look that green, that's the audio signal. That's coming from the D1. This is coming, you saw the trigger there, from the SEM. So I'll just call that SEM. Pretty cool. And so I know that this one this final one here is going to be the phosphor. You can see the signal level there. And if I set everything to the same key, I can't hit a wrong note. So that's a big power tip for you there on using a controller like KB-1. Yes, it does cost a few bucks, but you can see how I'm unlocking the power of that purchase um, because I really don't know all of my notes and scales as I should, and maybe you don't either. So this is a way that you know gets you over that what could be a roadblock to your song compositions. Now in this example, I have loaded up the TouchScaper app to be our controller. And I want this ribbon controller to be one, one of our synthesizers in AUM. And I want this uh, other synthesizer to be the the instrument A controller. So you can see that I've got those assigned to different parts of the TouchScaper. And I'm, I'm playing a pattern that I programmed in to that app. That is, again, another extension of what TouchScaper can do. It can be a controller. It can also play chord progressions. And you can program beats and progressions um, to build song, song ideas very quickly. So that's how I like to just have a couple different things going here and then see what I can develop, see what comes out of a session, a creative session, a writing session. This is just over here, the FM Player 2. It's being controlled if we look at the setup. Here I've got it on TouchScaper A. Okay, so I've, you don't need to give it AUM. You just give it 
touch scaper A, and we don't need this keyboard to do it. So it's just going to the instrument A of the touch scaper, which is on that radar screen. Okay, And this is synth 1, and it's going to the ribbon controller. Okay, If I wanted to further enrich the sound, I would probably be looking at adding another um, synthesizer or another yeah something um, that's very different sounding I might choose something really really crazy like factory no I'll just go with um, you know what I like I like cauldron cauldron is a fantastic app from Yonic Labs <laughs> I'm going to assign that to instrument B. So it'll mix in. I'm going to need to lower the volume there. Uh, it is on Touchscaper B. And let's go find a preset there. Um, I have some favorites. Like I said, I go through every app I buy and make a list of favorites. Here I've named uh, a bunch of them after German verbs because I was studying German uh, that winter. Um, so it became a way, okay, Laban, give it to me. Essen. So you can see what that is doing with this. Now if I go to the arranger, I can have it play a full chord progression here that I programmed in. Maybe not your idea, maybe not what the sounds that you want, but while it's playing there, now I can tweak. Or if I say, oh, that, that probably belongs It's really, really strange, right, to see So it's cool to have something playing because then you can sit there and tweak it and get the levels right, maybe change uh, the parameters or the key of what you want. And that's how you can have one controller with some automation, and this time using Touchscape automation to control three different sound sources for three different areas of the app. I hope that's important uh, knowledge and useful for you. So this is called Obertouch. And here I'm using the Magellan 2. Magellan 2 is fantastic sounding. 
synthesizer has some amazing sequencer built in. So again, before I go to something like AUM, I'll often just spend a lot of time with this particular synthesizer working up um, patches and saving those for a, f a further exploration later. So now if I go to Touchscaper, clearly I have Magellan working uh, at too hot of a level there. So here, this should have some information. If I solo that one, you're just going to hear the synth one playing this chord progression with this kind of random orbiting. And if I let the, the sound of the Oberheim, in this case, with a fat resonant kind of sound going on, I've got it with a, an eventide black hole reverb, so there's just a lot of delay on this one. Yeah, that's eventide black hole. So that's a, just a really deep sounding reverb. So. That's just the Oberheim, so it's mixing in with synth one here. And again, now, a hot mess. It's, it's just an extreme example. I may not actually choose that, but I will look into my favorites. And maybe there's rubulations that would work better. These are extreme effects. I mean, to your style of music, that may not be right or sound right. Um, but I'm just using these as kind of a, an extreme example. I would probably, generally what I tend to do is write more kind of cinema scores. Um, I don't do kind of beat, beat making and all that. Uh, I tend to like to want to perform what I'm doing here um, and get some a feeling, a vibe going, and I'll record it. And then I will rebuild it. Because this can also, this mixer can also feed Cubasis on the iPad. So that means I can take this and then have these outputs down here go to uh, input channels of Cubasis into a DAW, into like a multi track recording environment. Uh, but this is where song ideas start. This is where explorations happen. You're like, well, oh, that sounded a little weird, Rob. It does sometimes. That's just art is messy, right? Um, but when you want to make sure uh, that you get the good stuff and when you find something you really, really like, here's something, um, then you got a snapshot of it here and you can recall it and say, hey, I did some experiments that were kind of strange and then this one turned out with the triple keyboards to be pretty cool. And let's try.
We're in C major here. And the, um, the relative minor is A minor, so I'm going to go and get that A aeolian. So that's phosphor. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of the audio unit mixer, how to attach different controllers, external keyboards, uh, different apps, the advantage of using audio unit versions of apps that control um, different soundscapes and um, the beauty of the sound quality that you can get making music with your iPad. I'm Rob Montgomery. I hope you enjoyed this course.